Hi, welcome back to Thrive Live. Today we've got Jason and Ray, and they're going to introduce you to our guests today. And let's see what the guys have for us. Hi, Ray. Welcome. Thank you. Thank you, Beth. Hi, Jason. Tell us about your guest today. Well, greetings from Austin, Texas. So we're super happy to be here today. And we've got a great guest. We have um, a really, truly an old friend of ours, Steve Cadigan, who we've known for you know many years now. I actually went to graduate school with Steve Cadigan. So um, Steve has been on the forefront of the global talent strategy um, and company culture for the last 30 years. Um, Steve was really most famous for scaling LinkedIn from 400 employees to 4,000 employees in three and a half years. Um, Steve also led the development of LinkedIn's um, legendary company culture, which is just exquisite. Um, he was at the helm of the talent function for its period of highest growth, and he was there um, through their IPO. Um, Steve has worked in multiple industries, actually five different industries. He's worked in three different countries. He's led dozens of integrations all over the world, acquisition integrations. Steve has built um, just great talent teams. Um, he has unparalleled um, experience in the talent arena. And Steve's focus through Cadigan Talent Ventures is to focus uh, leaders and organizations to build winning talent, solutions to compete in an increasingly complex digital economy. So with that being said, We'd love to welcome Steve Caddy into our show today. Welcome, Steve. Well, hi, guys. Hey, Ray. Hey, Jason. Hey, Steve. Good to see you. I know last time I saw you guys, none of us had any gray hair. Look, look what happened. <laughs> yeah, I know. It's amazing. So true. After, so true. Uh, yeah. <laughs> Yeah. Well, first of all, you, thanks for for joining, Steve. You know, we really appreciate you joining us and providing you know providing your expertise, you know, uh, yeah, to to our show. Uh, we've got a couple of questions, and hopefully, we can just uh, you know have a good conversation here for the next thirty minutes or so. Great. So, Steve, we'd like to ask you a little bit. About what are your thoughts on the future of work? And could you tell us a little bit about where you see the future of work heading? Yeah, so this is probably for the last eight years since I've been out of the regular operating role in human resources where I've been really focusing a lot of my time is trying to find a better way for employers and employees to make sense of the world that's in front of us. And one of the challenges that I think that we all face is most of the forecasts of the future of work are all gloom and doom, right? You hear the stories of AI and automation, robotics taking jobs away. And I actually see an, a much more hopeful, much more uh, optimistic picture in that what I think we need to think about when we think about the future of work is that being human has never been more valuable. And so when I'm thinking about the future work, that's what I'm really focused on is trying to find a more meaningful framework, employer-employee relationship that really is fulfilling because a lot of the models that we're working with today as we're looking at the future of work are based on long tenure or an expectation that I've got to be loyal to you. And they don't stand up into the high fluid environment that I'm seeing when I travel around the world. And the biggest challenge I hear from executives uh, and my clients all over the planet is I can't find the right people and I can't keep the right people. And folks are just not staying, which is putting pressure on traditional models of most company benefit plans are driven by how long you stay there. And it's not really working today. So I'm trying to help professionals think differently about their careers and trying to help organizations think differently about building a new model that's going to be satisfying and feel safe in this highly unpredictable world that we work in today. What do you think some of the um, things are that create a satisfying model for workers? Are there one or two that come off the top of your head? Like a new model, you mean, Jason? Um, when you talk about employees being satisfied, what are some of the things that they're satisfied with now that they weren't satisfied with that, that are different? Well, that's an interesting question. You know, one of the, if you look at the, the workforce today, one could argue prior to COVID that we should be in a really great time where wages were rising, unemployment was down, and visibility to opportunities never been greater. But all the companies like Gallup that measure employee engagement are all saying that we've got the most disengaged workforce that we've ever had since they've been publishing their results since the year 2000. And so one of the things when I, when I go out there and look at is why is that people so unhappy when they should feel, you know, so much more 
power and so much more in control of their destinies than ever before. And I think there's a couple of underlying factors that are driving some of the dissatisfaction that's out there. So to answer your question, let me cover what I think is driving some dissatisfaction, which is we have more choice today pre-COVID and we will once we get back to something more normal uh, in the next months or years. Um, we have more choice than ever before, but we also know more about what we don't have at the company that we choose to work for than ever before. And that could create a little bit of, of envy and discontent. And I also think that things are changing so fast, industries getting disrupted. Companies like GE, for example, that 20 years ago were revered around the world as the greatest leadership and the greatest place to grow your career have now literally done a face plant and they've lost more market value almost a trillion dollars of market value in the last 20 years, which is leading people to say, hey, well, what's a safe place for me to work, you know? And I think what companies that I'm seeing, how they're responding to this and how you, I think, face a, a potential high disengagement factor among your workforce is you can't promise job security today. You can't promise long-term employment, but you should be promising you're making people better. And I think that's through investment and growth in their development. And so the organizations where I'm seeing people most feeling motivated, and this is, I think we had a, 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 a little bit of a taste for this when we were building LinkedIn, which is we're not promising that you're gonna be here forever, but we're gonna promise you while you're here, it's, it's gonna be the most gr growth and learning you've ever had in your career. And I think that doesn't cost anything. That's the good news is that it's really just a commitment. And so I think, you know, that's part of what I'm seeing. The people that are choosing to make movements are choosing to go to companies where they're going to learn a lot and not just because they have a lot of classes. I mean, through the work experience that they're being offered new assignments and new roles that are really informing their growth. So those are some of the things if I was looking for a job, I'd want to make sure that are that are in place that I can really grow and learn. Because I don't, even if a company promises me, hey, you're going to be here for 20 years, I'm not going to, who's going to believe that? Nobody yeah. believes that today because you can't. Exactly. In the future. So I think that's where I think this is going. You know, the more I get into future work, the more this is about the future of learning, which is kind of interesting. So why do you think culture is a competitive advantage to organizations? Um, so I, I think that today, because we have so much information about a company that we could go to work for than ever before, that you know, the whole, the old stories of, hey, we're a great place, we're nice, we have good benefits, we pay well, we've got a good product, we've got a good investment, we've got a good future. Everyone says that. So what is your advantage uh, today is who you are as a place to work. And Jason and, and Ray, one of the really biggest challenges, I think, for human resource leaders today is everyone's culture just changed in the blink of an eye. Coronavirus has changed how companies organize, how they communicate. How, what kind of business they're really focused on in so many dramatic ways that I think this is the biggest thing that, uh, that we're all trying to struggle with is, well, we were that culture when we worked together in a few locations. Now we're not in those locations and we don't know how long it's going to be that we won't be. And we don't know if people are going to be comfortable in that. And we're having to adjust to this whole new notion of culture. But I think if, if you want to be a place where the best people want to go, you have you have to really make your culture a competitive advantage because people have choice today, you know. That's so great. we talk a lot about wanting to um, obtain world class talent. How do you go about finding world class talent as an employer, and then how do you retain that world class talent once you have them? Yeah, so I think this is this is the challenge that everyone's struggling with. I think if you want to find the best talent you have to be the place that the best talent wants to be. And that's why I think culture is the core of this. You could hire an army of recruiters, but if you don't have your house as an attractive place for great talent, uh, the great talents, you, you may have all the greatest recruiting resources in the world, but you and you may get some of that talent, but that talent's not gonna stay. And great talent wants to be around other great talent. So I think you know, one of the challenges that I see with people that wanna make their culture great and wanna go after great talent is that they don't neglect to invest the time in really becoming aware of who are we and who's who's the ideal person to do great work here. Because no company could be the best place for everyone. And if you're trying to be the best place for everyone, you're just gonna look like vanilla ice cream. I mean, you're not gonna have a real clear differentiator in the market. And so I think you know companies really have to say, if, if we want the best, we have to be the best place for that talent. 
And so then you have to ask your high performers, what is it about this place that's keeping you here? What, why, you know, what are we doing that's providing you the opportunity to do great work? You know, and so I think that's probably the best investment. It's not some brand campaign that you could do. It's not some marketing pitch. You have to be really authentic and real and you have to really deliver on that. And as I said earlier in the last few questions, Jason, I think this is really about creating a culture of learning uh, that's going to inspire people to do great things and, and caring about people beyond just the time they work for you. And, and uh, you know, you and I, uh, uh, all three of us have been in touch offline and you guys know that I'm in the middle of finishing up a book on the future of work. And one of the big elements of the book should be coming out in December that I'm trying to bring out is this fact that, you know, we should be as leaders, if you want great talent to come work for you, thinking about your relationship beyond just when they work for you, you know, and thinking about helping them as a coach and as a mentor, because they may come back or they may go to a company and you can do a partnership with them or, or they may be referring candidates to you. So it's about opening your eyes to our culture is not just in the confines of, uh, you know, who's a, t you know, quote unquote employee. And I think the other challenging, interesting reality that COVID's presented to us is many companies, because they're uncertain about the future right now, are not building a huge, a bigger workforce. They're building a huge contingent workforce because they have to, you know, be careful around making investments when they're uncertain about what's happening next in the marketplace. So, and that presents a whole nother dimension of challenge, I think, which is, you know, we want to hire great people, but how many should we hire right now? Because we don't know what the, how the market's going to change. And then we have an election year in the United States, which also is a layer of complexity on top of that. So, I mean, it's a great time to be in recruiting and HR because the, there's no shortage of challenges, right? Exactly. Well, yeah, when you, true. um, when you talk about maintaining that relationship with people after they leave, um, there's been a lot of discussion over the last several years about empathy. Could you talk a little bit about how empathy is an important leadership characteristic for um, folks going forward in today's day and age? Yeah, it's interesting. You know, I think for those of us in human resources, and, and you guys can relate to this, I mean, your strength as a leader, your strength as a human resource executive really comes from helping see the world through someone else's eyes and helping understand you know, why they may be feeling what they're feeling. Most of my latter stage of my career was really negotiating different points of view around something that both people participated in but saw something completely different happen. And I think the more that we can pause and build this capacity for empathy, I think that the more capable we're going to be to deal with hard stuff. Now, if you ask me, what's the biggest problem in the world of work today? It's that I think we're losing the ability to talk about hard stuff, diversity, race relations, you know, gender you know, issues, you know, sexual harassment. It's becoming in this world of 140 character tweets and text messages and seduction with technology to communicate with each other. I really worry that we're losing this capability of you know, trying to find what's common about us versus what's different about us and trying to find a way for us to be able to work through that. And so, you know, when I think about empathy, I think it's really at the core of helping us navigate uh, something together and solving a problem together versus I'm going to take my position and you you don't agree with me. Okay, well, then I hate you, you know, or you're mm -hmm. wrong or everything about you yeah. is wrong. And yeah. that's just not constructive. And, yeah. you know, but I look around and I say, wow, the biggest debate in America right now is what is the truth? We're debating what's the truth now. Yeah. And it's really, uh, you know, it's facilitated by all kinds of social media, uh, messy stuff out there. But I think, you know, getting back to sort of why is this an important topic today? I think in an era of you know, uncertainty, what empathy can do for you is help you build trust. And trust leads to safety. And people are feeling very uncomfortable right now. There's so many unknowns. You know, this house used to be just a house. Well, the last six months it became a school and a business office. You know? Yeah, exactly. Yeah. And, yeah. and you know, I, I was joking with some human resource colleagues the other day. I said, I wonder if we're going to see our first sexual harassment complaint come up of a worker in their home complaining that their teenager is making the work environment hostile. You know, so like <laughs> yeah. someone complaining, complaining against their, and, and then nature is going to go, oh crap, what are we going to do? And, uh, so it's just like, you know, yeah. so many things have changed. But the good news is, I think if I look at the, the, the domain of work, 
this whole world going upside down is the best fertile time for organizations to tackle big change problems. You know, because everything else is changing. Well, now let's go after the thing about our company that we really wanted to change. You know, because everyone's ready for it. Everyone's adapting in different ways. You know what I'm saying? The readiness is there. And we're never going to see a time like this. I hope we never see a time like this again. But we're, gosh, we're learning to all be more adaptable and resilient. Those are really valuable skills. And, you know, I think for those people who want to go about and doing different things in their organizations, now's a great time to tackle those. Yeah, that's a super great point. Yeah, is, and and point. it really resonates. Yeah. Ray, I think you had a couple questions for Steve. Yeah, um, you know, talking about organizational change, Steve, um, you know, maybe you can talk a little bit about kind of you know, what should HR's role, you know, role be um, in tackling some of these big changes and, and how should the HR team step up? Yeah, well, I know you guys and, and a lot of the audience have seen a lot of the studies where you know, after years and years of research at, at both Harvard and Stanford and some companies like Google have played around and what they found is people do their best work when there's a high degree of psychological safety. And I think in a world where there seems to be many reasons why we should feel unsafe, you know, that I think human resources really needs to raise the cadence of pulsing people more regularly. Like if you were surveying your employees once a year. I, I used to, I've been telling people this for a long time now. If you're surveying your employees once a year, you're not surveying your employees. Like you got to do it much more frequently. And if you were doing it once a year, you better move it to twice. And if you're doing it twice, I would move it to four times. Not to create a huge action list for you, but you got to create a higher cadence of listening and getting a pulse of how people are doing. Because what's happening is your workforce is now working. Most organizations are working from home, working differently. And the calculus of their whole career map is changing. So, wow, if I can work from home, maybe I can work for a company in another country that wasn't open to me working for them before or in a different you know, geography in the US. So people may find different elements of choice and human resources should be mindful of that, that we could also mine in different pools of talent, maybe in different parts of the world, the more our organization gets comfortable with this whole you know, working remotely thing. But I think that, you know, when I think about this, Ray, I also think about the Canadian government in rebuttal to people saying, hey, we're all working from home. We should all go work from home. The Canadian government said, time out. We're not all working from home. We're at home trying to get work done during a crisis. That's a little different. And mm -hmm. I, I think it's true. I'm, I'm seeing a bunch of companies go, you know, full you know, from now on, we're going to go work from home. And I'm like, pause, pause right there. Why are you doing that? You don't know what's going to happen in your business. You don't know if your company can handle that long term. Why don't you try it for a while because you have to and then reevaluate. But I think human resources, the best thing that we can do is raise the bar of getting the pulse and listening so that you can quickly adapt the organization and your recommendations for leadership on things that you might need to do differently. Things that worked the way you were structured before. We have a whole new org structure now. And is it working? And is it happening? And are people feeling connected? And you know, are they feeling like this culture is you know, a place they want to continue to be? Because it is different, right? Right, right. Um, you touched a little bit about on leadership before and, and why you know, empathy is important and, and learning is important. Uh, but you know, what does leader, what do leaders need to be doing differently, especially in the post COVID environment uh, that, they, that they've been doing in the past? I mean, what, what's your perspective on, on leadership and how that's changing significantly? Yeah, Ray, I think there's a few small things, uh, again, tied to some of the pieces that I mentioned earlier, which is I think leaders need to check in more frequently. I think leaders do need to say, are you doing, are you okay? Are you in a place where you can be productive today? You know, and I think leaders need to be more mindful. You know, I, I really think this COVID thing is sort of, as I say, the completed the merger of work and life. Like there's no more work-life balance. It's just, it's one now at the merger is complete. Mm -hmm. And yeah. what that means is everybody has a different framework that we didn't have before. For example, if I was going to the office most days, um, now I'm home, I've got kids of different ages that are gonna need different, you know, levels of attention from me and my partner if I have one at home at different points of the day. So I need a leader to appreciate and recognize that my work contribution calculus, that my availability, my hours of being able to be productive are going to be impacted by things that they weren't impacted by before because my school can't take my kids or my kids too small to really manage online learning by themselves. So I think leaders are going to have to be very attuned 
to the fact that we don't have just a nine to five that works for everyone. It doesn't work for everyone anymore. And it probably didn't work very well before, but it's kind of what we were working with. And so I think we're, we're having to head into a new realm of customization in leadership in teams that is, we don't know how it's gonna play out. But I think if I'm a leader, I wanna kind of know what are the circumstances. And, and I think there's some goodness here in that leaders are going to, and employees hopefully are gonna have more of a personal connection because we have to to understand how we're gonna to work together and you know, what are your challenges, what are my challenges during the day and the timelines, right? Like if a doorbell rings at this house right now where I'm communicating with you from, my dogs are gonna start freaking out, right? And it's not something that is gonna feel very professional to me, but it's just the reality here. Mm -hmm. And I've also been doing other interviews uh, where I have a chat box and my son pop up and say, hey, when's lunch gonna be ready? And I'm like, so <laughs> Yeah, <laughs> we know that I, I wasn't making lunch for him, but but it's like yeah. I didn't have to deal with that before, and now I do. And you yeah. know, I want I want harmony in my home. I want harmony at my work. But gosh, mm -hmm. I mean, this is a big pivot for leaders. And if you just think, oh, I've got to you know meet my numbers or I've got to meet my deliverables, the whole foundations of meeting those deliverables has changed. And so I think it's time to step back and really understand that I think people are going to want more understanding from leaders from their for their personal circumstances rather than the separation of oh that's not going to impede my ability to to be successful here to thrive right it's just a yep. new reality yep exactly yep one one other question just just around you know employees and you talked about it earlier having more much more uh, many more options now that they're working remotely and they can work for anybody um you know what are what are some of the things that you're seeing, you know, from a from an employment perspective, um, around other companies trying to attract talent um, in this in this model in this new model? Yeah. So first, I mean, I don't want to lead anyone to believe that I don't fully recognize that there's more unemployment than we've ever seen before. So anyone here who's in that position, you know, I don't want to lead you to believe that. Oh, yeah, it's a great market to look for. It's not. It's like the nuclear winter of job opportunities right now. <laughs> yeah. Exactly. But, um, but at the same, but at the same time, what I'm seeing organizations do, Ray, is they're stepping back and they're retuning their whole recruitment flow, for example, or they're retuning a bunch of processes mm -hmm. in the HR domain. They're taking that time to kind of make that flow better. Mm -hmm. And I think for employees, what I think they're leveraging is the enormity of a downloadable learning content. I mean, I don't know mm -hmm. about you guys, but I've been a junkie for whether it's you know TED Talks, Masterclass. Uh, even, you know, I just downloaded this learning about my tennis, tennis strategies and so forth. It's just phenomenal resources that are available out there. And I think that, you know, my, my belief for employees today is that if you start looking for a job when you lost your job, it's too late. That the world is changing so fast that we owe it to ourselves and our families to always be on the lookout for mm -hmm. market trends and new opportunities. And it really comes down to, you know, continually growing your network. You know, and I've known yeah. each of you guys over over 20 years. And, you know, sometimes we were working closely together. Sometimes we didn't talk to each other for a long period of time. But I still know you. I, I, I trust you. I hope you trust me so that mm -hmm. if there is something that comes up, boom, we, we can connect. And I think now the people who are more advanced in their career, let's say people 40, 50 plus, 60 plus. I mean, I'm having a lot of conversations, people saying, you know, are people really going to want me? You know, and I'm seeing, oh, yeah, tons of people are still going to want you. But you have to show you have to beat this paradigm that people have that the older you are, the slower you learn or the less amenable you are, to, you know, using Slack, for example, in the office or using new tools, you know, and you're setting your ways. And I think that's that's a necessary script for all of us is this notion of, the, you know, lifelong learning or learn. I call it learning velocity. What some people call it learning agility, that the more we have that the more value we, we become. So for example, I think, I, you know, you heard, you heard it here, and this is one of the things I talk about in my book. I think the deep professional expert is, is at risk because if you go deep, let's say in auto, or you go deep in banking, and then the market takes a hit, well, you're in trouble. But mm -hmm. if, you, if you're in human resources, for example, we're, we're lucky. We can go to any industry, any country in the world, and, and that makes us more employable. And so I think your value today is not just what you know now. I think increasingly your value of what you can learn is more valuable than what you know, because whatever company you're going to go work for, whatever business you're going to be in, it's going to change. 
they're going to need to know that you can learn new stuff. And so the more you show this learning agility, I think the more valuable you're going to become. And that just, you know, we all, we all are capable of learning new things for the rest of our lives, but it, unfortunately, and this is why I think a lot of people are unhappy. Unfortunately, it's not the model we used to have, which is go to school, learn a trade, and it, it'll cover me for the rest of my working life. It doesn't work like that now. Now it's like, go to school, learn stuff, unlearn it, learn new stuff, unlearn that, learn new stuff and keep going. Right. right. And right. I, I like that. I like that. I like a little bit of that craziness. And by the way, craziness does inspire some energy. I mean, any of you that are like rolling your eyes going, oh my God, the HR guy's talking about get comfortable with change again. I mean, the truth is, I think when I've been most motivated in my career is when I've been a little bit scared doing something new. And that's really been energizing for me. Mm -hmm. And, you know, the, the woman who sort of coined the phrase growth mindset uh, says, when you feel scared, that's when you're growing. And that's, yeah. a good thing, you know, and yeah. so I think, gosh, I mean, human resources, we just got a lot to think about and professionals have a lot to think about given so many things that are, that are in play. Yep. Ski, no. how do we, how do we tap into your, or how do people tap into your expertise? So they're going to listen to this broadcast. They're going to be super excited by everything that you have to say. And they're going to be like, oh my God, that guy's amazing. And they're going to want more. How do we get more of you? And right. how do we direct people to you? So Jason, I, you know, having worked in human resources, mostly for 30 years in large organizations until LinkedIn was my first small company. And when I left, it was sort of a big company. Um, I've, I've spent the last eight years trying to figure out like, what's my place, what's my space and where do I want to play? And my space is really in ignition of new ideas. So the places that I like to go are when an organization or a leadership team or a leader feels stuck and they want, they, they believe we need a new talent strategy, whatever that is, uh, whether it's culture or recruiting or compensation awards, whatever that is, I like to go and be an igniter. And if someone wants some long-term, like, yeah, I like what he's saying. How do we bring that to life? That's when I partner with someone like you guys or a bunch of other partners that I have to sort of help bring some of that to life. Because I, I, my role right now is more sort of a paradigm breaker and an idea generator. And I call myself sort of a flash consultant because I, I don't do long-term projects. If, if I do have a client where there's a love connection, well, I'll consider an <laughs> advisory board role or you know, a board of directors role. Thank you, but, Chuck Woolery. Yes, thank you. <laughs> right, right. <laughs> yeah. for the audience who knows Chuck, but but yes, yeah, exactly. Know, yeah, and I got a, a a website. People can find me on LinkedIn super easily. But my website's my name, stevecadigan.com. Uh, I've been experimenting. Uh, I was talking to Ray about this the other day. I've been experimenting with TikTok in the last five weeks, and I've I've been putting out a ton of content on TikTok you know, anywhere from 15 seconds to almost a minute around everything from, you know, job search, interviewing, salary negotiations. We've got a whole component on compensation coming up. And I've found a really receptive audience with that. It's very vocal. Um, but anyway, it's been a new place. So anyone who wants to sort of see me in a like 20 second snippet, there's a whole bunch of stuff out there that I would uh, encourage people to to check out. And I'm hoping that this whole TikTok thing gets solved and people's worry about the security gets gets worked out soon. Are you dancing while you do the videos or are they dance free videos? <laughs> no, I, I am the boring alternative to that, you know? Okay, all right, we're good, all right, thank good. you. All right, anything, anything you wanna leave us with, Steve, um, that we should take away from this really great conversation? Yeah, I, I, let me just say to the audience here, uh, because it's the elephant in the room. Here we are in the middle of a crisis. In California, we have the benefit of, hey, we've got wildfires too. Isn't that awesome? We can't breathe either. I think I want to encourage everyone to, to remember that every economic recession that the world's experienced, the last big one that we felt particularly sharply in the U.S. was the banking meltdown 2007 through 2009. More innovation happens in dark times than in normal times because dark times force us to look more deeply and to solve problems with more intensity. And 30 of the top 300-ish unicorns today were all founded in 2007 through 2009. So wow. it's really, really, so Uber, Airbnb, Slack, Glassdoor, Groupon, those are just a handful of the ones in Dropbox. Those are just a handful of companies that were born in dark times. So, you know, the tendency initially as a human being is to get in the fetal position, you know, and play defense. 
<laughs> yeah, now exactly. Is time. Now is a great time. I want to encourage people to play offense. If you want to pivot your career, you want to change something in your company, I think the soil is really fertile for that. So those are the, the parting words that I'd like to offer to the audience. Well, you, Steve, Steve, you did not disappoint. You're as wonderful as always. So thank you for agreeing to be on the show. And we look forward to all your continued success. So thank you for everything you do for us. Yeah. We really appreciate it. We really appreciate Thanks, it, Steve. Guys. Thanks, Thanks for having me on the show. Thank you. All right, thank you.